of minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn, and Ryan Nicodemus is down in Florida right now. He's taking care of his grandma. So today I have with me Paul Jarvis. We're going to talk about minimalist business models. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship. We're going to talk about building a small business. And we're going to talk about Paul's book. It's called Company of One. It's available now wherever you listen to or read books these days. Uh, and, oh, and we're going to answer your questions. Paul is here with me to answer all of your questions. Thanks for being here today, Paul. Yeah, no worries. It's fun. I don't think Ryan exists because <laughs> last time when you came on tour to where I live, he wasn't there. Now, now you and now he's not here again. You live on an island. Yes. And you live on an island within an island, sort of. Uh, what? What? Uh, so, so you're on Vancouver Island. Yes. Uh, and I was, I was doing a tour stop in 2015 in Victoria, and we were actually splitting them up back then. We were doing the word tasting tour, and um, when when you were we we went out there. Um, it's a beautiful city, but then you don't even live in the city. You live like no. way north, right? Well, I live south. Oh. So, but I live in the woods outside of the city. It's on gorgeous some... too. What? And, and you moved from the actual city, from Vancouver, right? Yeah, I lived on Robson Street. Like, I, you could not get more downtown than I lived oh. <laughs> when I lived in Van. What was the uh, what was the impetus of of making this significant lifestyle change? Yeah, I think it was. I don't think we realized how much noise there was until we removed it from our life. Mm. And I mean like the noise of being busy, the noise of just the sound of the city all the time. We had an air purifier that acted as a white noise machine. Now I have a white noise machine. It's much smaller <laughs> for travel. We also, there was a billboard just outside our bedroom window. So we had blackout blinds and I just felt like, and I'm glad my wife felt the same, that we were spending so much time blocking out all of the things around us. And we were like, what if we just live somewhere where we don't have to block anything out? What if we live somewhere where it's just peace and quiet? And so, yeah, we, we left the city. We moved out during the Winter Olympics in Vancouver, which I don't recommend moving out during Olympics. Most of the roads are closed. <laughs> so it was like the worst game of Frogger ever. But yeah, I, the island is amazing and living kind of in the woods where it's just trees. I think the the noisiest thing is raccoons at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what's fascinating is you're still able to run a business or businesses, however sure. we want to, to, to define that. And you wrote this book, which I really enjoyed, called Company of One. What, 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 what made you decide that, okay, I need to sort of distill down everything I've learned about running businesses and putting it put it into this book? Yeah, I, it was my newsletter. Like I, I write a weekly newsletter called Sunday Dispatches. So I send a, an email out every single Sunday and I usually get a couple hundred replies. And so I wrote an article about, I think it was called something like why I don't care about growth in my business. And I sent Which that sounds, out. That, that <laughs> sounds to most people when they, when they hear it, especially in our uh, nothing but growth business model, it sounds to people like it's sacrilegious. Yeah. And it was mostly just, I was like, I'm just going to explain to people the weird way that I run a business that probably they're not, people are going to be like, okay, whatever. This is just Paul's way of doing things. And I sent it out and I got a couple thousand replies from people saying like, oh, I thought I was the only one who felt this way. I thought I was the only one who wanted to challenge growth or have different metrics for success in my business. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> I, I think there's something here because everybody on my list kind of resonated with that. So I was like, okay that that seems like that seems like that could be a book i had a lot to say on that topic so yeah so so the theory behind company of one is um unabashed growth isn't necessarily a good thing yeah it's so growth i think is sometimes useful like when you start a business you need to go from zero to something like right. you need to have profit have customers all that so growth does make sense but but so but so often we don't know what that something is. It's just like yes. well, I better uh, I need to get bigger next year, next quarter, next month, next yes. week. Tomorrow has to be bigger, bigger, bigger because bigger equals better. But it doesn't necessarily because it adds unnecessary bureaucracy and redundancies, and some of those things uh, are necessary when we want to build something that requires those things. But I think quite often we don't ask ourselves why am I building this? Why am I doing this? Why do I want to grow? Yeah, I got to 10x something. It doesn't matter <laughs> what it is. I'm just going to find something and 10x it. And I think 
a lot of us get into business for ourselves because we want more freedom. Mm -hmm. And that seems pretty good. Like, that's why I run a business. But then we get into it and we get into like the machinations of running a business. And then we're like, oh, well, this has to be a legitimate. I don't know what legitimate means. That's why I'm air quoting. (laughs) But like, I have to run a legitimate business. So I need to have like an office and then employees and then payroll and then a CFO for some reason. Uh And it's like, we start a business with these intentions of wanting more freedom. And then we just keep adding more trappings and more responsibility on the business because we think we want to legitimize or we think this is the way the business is supposed to run. So I'm just going to keep adding more because more is apparently better. And yeah, the point of the book is that more isn't necessary or more isn't the byproduct of business success or it doesn't have to be freedom can be the byproduct of business success because when you have success you should have the freedom to choose does this growth make sense to me maybe it does but maybe it doesn't maybe it would impede my freedom and then i can say no to that and i can feel better about saying no to this opportunity or to this growth because it's challenging or it's hindering the freedom that i want to have in my life the freedom that i want my business to give myself i can tell you that after reading the book and i I realized that I no longer was worried about or consumed with the idea of like reaching more people and having a greater audience. For me, it really solidified the idea that if I could add value to an existing audience or maybe even a smaller audience, uh, the opposite of growth is not necessarily atrophy, but it's finding what Seth Godin would call the the minimum viable audience, right? And, and, and reaching out to those people. And so we've done that in a few different ways. Uh, one is we do this Patreon thing now where we do these maximal episodes and it's for a much smaller group of people. You know, there are a million to three million downloads this podcast gets a month, but our Patreon has what, 30 some, uh, it has about 3,000 or so people who listen yeah. to it, right? But we, we dive really deep in ways that I, I feel it's like a comedian working things out in a a comedy club like you're not doing it in an arena we're able to test out new ideas and fail in front of a small audience and then sometimes some of those ideas make their way to a bigger audience sometimes they're too intimate and we can only share it with that small audience anyway and it would ruin the actual thing that we're talking about if a million people were listening to that thing it doesn't start with the netflix special right (laughs) Right, right. And it, it, if every if every conversation we had was broadcast on Netflix, I would feel so vulnerable that I, I wouldn't be able to communicate what I actually wanted to communicate. Now, we have some questions here today. Our first question is from Taylor in Boise, Idaho. I work for a large telecommunications company, and as you're probably familiar with, that means that I'm constantly juggling dozens of tasks, buyers, and email Here's the thing. I really enjoy the work I do. I'm not interested in leaving, but I do want to better understand how to incorporate and marry the principles of minimalism in my daily work without sacrificing needing my deliverables or my relationships with my leadership or my ability to move forward in the company. Now, Paul, one thing that I find fascinating about Taylor's question with respect to your philosophy and your book is you talk about bringing this company of one mindset, this entrepreneur mindset into the business world as well, where you're actually working for someone else, but you you have the, the mindset of the company of one. Let's talk about that mindset a little bit. Yeah, I think a lot of times, especially when working with a, a team, you need to be really good at sharing what your boundaries are with other people because otherwise especially in a company setting you're just gonna your plate's just keep gonna, gonna keep getting fuller and fuller mm-hmm. if and you everyone don't everyone else's priorities are going to become your priorities exactly so i think if we become better at saying like what is realistic for us to do and not realistic for us to do because at the end we both parties want the same thing leadership wants a good wants a company to run, wants a company to be profitable. The employee wants to do a good job, wants a company to do well so the company can keep going. So if you come to an agreement with like, what's realistic for me to do? So if I'm not working like 16 hours a day, I can do, I can do my job better. I'm not always tired. I'm not always busy, frantic, overwhelmed. If I have a reasonable amount of work and you have reasonable expectations for me, then 
things can happen. Things will happen probably quicker if there's not, you have to file like 18 TPS reports for different managers sort of thing. Sure. Like if there's ways to make it so you can do the, the work that you have to do and possibly be given a, as you work there too, at the more autonomy you get, the more ownership people will feel over the projects that they do. And then that's not a matter of having to spend all of this time either micromanaging the people that are working for you or being micromanaged by the people above you. If there's autonomy there and autonomy comes from mastery, so it doesn't happen just like day one, like oh, everybody has autonomy. It's like as you prove yourself and as you prove yourself as, as trustworthy and have the ability to own the work that you're doing, then you should be given a bit more and more reign to, to do the work and not be like, this is how you do the work, get it done by this date, but given the opportunity to say like, okay, this is the work that you need me to do. I, I know that I can get it done or my team can get it done in this time. This is how we're going to do it and, and trust us to get this done because we will. I find that part of her question is, that is frustrating t to me is she said, I enjoy the job that I have, but then immediately lists <laughs> off all the things that that she doesn't enjoy, right? The, the, the tasks, the fires, the emails. And while it is true that no matter what your job is or if you're a company of one working by yourself, there are going to be some things that are tedious or administrative or even creatively tedious. You know, mm -hmm. writing a book isn't always 100% pleasurable. In fact, <laughs> half the time you want to put your head through a wall because you're like, oh, this isn't working. It's a stupid thing. And I just have to delete a whole chapter. I can't believe I, what am I doing? I'm a fraud. There are things that happen even in, in the, uh, that have a creative payoff. There will always be the drudgery. However, you may be in an environment where there's a lot of unnecessary bureaucracy going on. And that is the sort of antith antithesis of the, the company of one mindset where mm -hmm. it's everyone else's priorities, it's meetings about meetings, it's work to justify one's position. Can you talk a little bit about how you deal with, uh, with bureaucracy in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, you need to walk a bit of a fine line because you're working in a team environment. You need to make sure that everybody feels like they're being heard and that everybody's kind of being taken into account with their input. But I also think like everybody's human, right? Like I think a lot of times in bigger companies, and I mean, you can speak to this too, because your old job was at a big corporation, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that if we talk to each other, like human beings, like, do we need to have this meeting? Like I, I value the work that you're doing, but like, can we just send a, an email with three sentences in it yeah. instead of having a 30 minute meeting about the meeting that we have to have about the meeting next week? I can think of, I can think of several times that I, back in the corporate world, made things a lot more efficient. And, and to, do th to do so, it wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to come in and change everything. Yes. I was able to do it from a position where I wasn't even in power. I was um, I was a retail store rep, and I just worked in, in a retail store. But I started hosting these small meetings where I would train other people about particular products uh, at the beginning of each month. And that turned into eventually I got a promotion based on that, and I was training several stores that came together. And then I brought a whole region of stores together because it was more efficient. And it started out just by me saying, hey, I'm going to take the reins on this because I have a better way of doing it. Now, I'm not going to come in and say, look at me, this is the better way of doing things. Uh, because no one likes to be told that they're, for they're going to be forced into changing something. Yeah. But if you show them repeatedly that something is better, here's a better way to do it. So through the meeting, it's like, hey guys, I'm going to have this 10 minute standing meeting and we're going to cover these three topics. We're going to stay on topic. And by the end of this, we're all going to leave here with action items and deliverables. Then people might recognize like, wow, we've been wasting so much time in these 90 minute long meetings. That 10 minute meeting, not only is it much shorter, but it's more effective. And I walk away feeling like uh, we've accomplished something and we're going to actually accomplish something from, from that meeting itself. So I think that you can, you know, the, the cliche is lead by example, yeah. but you can just, sh it's more display by example, show people how things could be more effective, more efficient, and maybe every other email isn't, doesn't require a response. And, and uh, every Every deliverable can be delivered in a way that doesn't require you know, an entire day being uh, uh, drained of uh, all your resources. Yeah. I mean, my favorite email um, closing is no response necessary. Uh. When I see that, I'm like, yes. 
right. and and to me in my, in my mind i before i hit the respond button almost always i i will ask myself will this add value does this re- is this response necessary i don't need to respond back with a quick thanks to every email it's just clogging up people's inboxes i'm envisioning a world one day without email but we'll uh we'll figure that out on some other podcasts taylor i want to give you two books to help you out here uh one is i'm going to give you paul's book it's called a company of one and so sean if you could uh, send her a copy of that i would really appreciate it and also our book essential is an essay collection with 150 different essays about 12 different areas of intentional living there's an entire chapter in there on priorities and i think what what taylor is dealing with right now is figuring out what are the priorities because right now it's a fire hose of everything's coming at me at once i'm busy 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 but how do i take these items how do i take other people's priorities and make sure they're in line with my priorities we've got an entire chapter in there about priorities so if you like our podcast you'll like the audiobook version of that or if you want the book book or the ebook we'll be happy to send those to you as well i'm going to move on to our lightning round paul now this is where Ryan and I usually do our best to answer every question with just a, a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We also put the text to these uh, minimal maxims, we call them, uh, in the show notes so you people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if they'd like. Uh, we're at The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you are at Paul Jarvis without any vowels or an L. <laughs> you got that right. Most people don't. <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll put a link to your social media in the show notes as well, but... Uh, you can find all of our pithy answers in one place now, minimalmaxims.com. Jessica puts them up there, shares them, uh, so people have... Ha- well, here's what we really do, Paul, is we just we ramble on a bit, bit we pontificate, we maunder on until we get something that is, that is uh, plausibly tweetable. So our first question is from Dimitri in New York City. Dimitri says... How do I determine what amount of social media pre- presence is actually having a positive effect on my business? Now, I have a, a, a pithy answer for you, and then we can unpack it. I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. Social media can enhance your business, but it is not the point of your business. And I, I know for me, the thing I just talked about a second ago with the email asking, does this add value? I do the same thing with social media. Before I tweet something, before I post something on Facebook or Instagram, the question that I'm asking, or I'm asking Jessica, who manages our social media now, is, is this a way, the best way to add value to our audience? I'm not just sharing a, a picture of my breakfast or, or whatever, because for me, I don't see that as adding value. Now, for some people, you know, maybe you are a chef and that's a great way for you to add value to an audience so it's not to say that you can't ever do that but social media shouldn't be and except in rare exceptions it shouldn't be the point of our business but i think too often we are we're spending a disproportionate amount of time but not really getting a return on social media is that is that accurate yeah i mean all of the all of the research that i've done and the studies that they show that social media doesn't really convert very high for sales. Like it doesn't, it helps with building things like brand awareness or it, for me, it helps with building personal connection or sarcastic connection with people. Right. It's really why I use social media is sarcasm. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, I think there's better ways because people don't really listen on social media. They're just there to kind of like refresh, refresh, refresh. So I would rather create more meaningful connections, more meaningful relationships with the people that I'm trying to reach, the customers or potential customers through things like my mailing list, because then it's a direct connection. If they reply, it goes to me and then I can reply to them. It's a direct connection. We're having a conversation here. So that to me makes a lot more sense. I also think that people, especially who have started businesses recently, I guess don't don't always see that business has existed a lot longer than social media. Right. So people are like, I can't believe you're not on Facebook or not on LinkedIn. Like, how do you run your business? And like, I started my business in the 90s when there wasn't Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. There was, I think there was MySpace. Maybe MySpace came a bit later, but mm. like you don't have to use, and that's the thing. Like people think, oh, I, I have to use social media because everybody else is using social media. But when we get into situations like that where it's we're competing with everybody else, it's really hard to stand out. It's really hard to be uh, be above the noise in those situations. Yeah. And I think quite often we use social media 
as a solution, but we're not really sure of what the problem <laughs> is. Yeah. You're like, I've got a solution that's in search of a problem. And if that's the case, then obviously it's too much. So back to Dimitri's question, what amount of social media presence is actually having a positive effect on my business? I think if it's adding value to your clients, customers, followers, et cetera, your audience, then then it is having a positive effect effect or influence on on your business however if it is getting in the way of you actually creating if it is a place uh, at which you can pacify yourself or just mindlessly consume then it's getting in the way of what your the core of your business or your creativity is and if, if that's the case then you know you might want to do something like what cal newport talks about and we had him on the podcast talking about the 30-day digital declutter and just removing those things from your life and then slowly bringing them back in. So removing it from your business is a great way to do it. And then slowly bringing it back in, finding ways that it will add the appropriate amount of value. Kareem from Patreon asks, how were you able to walk away from your corporate job's identity? It seems like society is constantly pegging who we are on what we do it's the first question we ask each other right it's like hey what do you do yeah. it happened to me right before this so i was out on the patio here and some guy was like hey what um i saw your 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 studio space and it has the minimalist on there what do you do and i'm like oh that's an expansive question how much time do you got do we have a time limit here um what do you do and what we're really asking is like what is the job title on your business card so I can compare you to me on the corporate structure, the ladder, the socioeconomic ladder, and I can see whether or not you're worth uh, what communicating with. And and so, yes, identity is, is something that is tied up quite often in our job title, but we're so much more than our job titles. And when someone asks you what you do, I mean, sure, you could say I'm a podcaster, I'm a writer, or I have a website or designer, or you could say all of these things, but all the, all the things are, they're just a sliver of what you do. And especially if you pan out outside of business, it's only a sliver of what you do as a human being. So my, my pithy answer is our identities are shaped by the costumes we wear. That is actually the first line of our book, Everything That Remains. Um, and I'm sitting in, in in that book, I'm sitting in this sort of business meeting at the beginning of the book and uh, realizing like that we're all in this like disgusting room that is like off white. We're all wearing these weird white shirts and like we're pale in this windowless room. And, and, uh, I realize I'm wearing this costume. Now, part of it is the, the actual costume. Like, I'm wearing yeah. this this uniform, right? Yeah. But the other part is, like, how I am projecting myself on onto the world, the costumes we wear. And part of that has to do with how we actually answer the question. When someone asks me that qu question now, I tend to tell them what I'm passionate about. Yeah. I rephrase the question. I, instead of saying, what do you do? I'll say, what are you passionate about? Occasionally, you'll get a, a deer in headlights look. But quite often the, it'll change the entire direction of the conversation into something more meaningful. So how do you handle this when someone says, what do you do? Depends if I want to have a conversation or not, to, okay. to be honest. Like, because sometimes like the easiest answer is writer mm -hmm. and that can lead to more things, but it can be, it, yeah, it depends because I do so many things. Like if somebody asked me online, I just post the, the gif of Homer Simpson just kind of shrinking into the bush. Like, <laughs> yeah. Because it's hard, like it's a hard question to answer when you work for yourself. And I remember when I started working for myself and I told people like, I'm a, I work for myself and they're like, well, what do you do for a job? Because for it, like in the nineties, freelancing really wasn't a thing. Uh -huh. And they're like, well, no, what agency do you, cause I was a designer. They're like, well, what agency do you work at? I'm like, I, mine, mm -hmm. I guess. And there's like, Where, where's your office? I'm like, my spare bedroom. But now it's like, this is something that people, this is something that a lot of people do. So it's something that is a lot more common and so now the answer is easier to explain like if i just say oh, i'm a freelancer people are like i get that mm -hmm. whereas in the past it was you're a freelancer what is what, what do you mean you work for free <laughs> i don't get it <laughs> right well you know it's it, it's funny it, we have these these sort of canned answers and i think you know kareem might be somewhere where she is working a job that pays the bills and it's and that's fine but she also doesn't want that to be her entire identity she doesn't want to say well i'm a sales manager or, or i am an accountant or whatever um and so 
I think I think for me quite often it's reframing the question as what is this person actually what are they trying to get out of me uh, they're probably just trying to have small talk at this yeah, point yeah. and that's the easiest in for them and so what you can do it and it takes a little bit of courage not a lot but it, because it's different you're giving them a different answer and you can say you know what I'm really passionate about writing or I'm really passionate about snowboarding i'm really passionate about surfing and all of a sudden they're like that's what you do you're like yeah i really enjoy it and they're like but do you make a living from surfing no but that'd be <laughs> awesome wouldn't it i wish yeah. i could no i just whenever i'm off work it's the thing i'm most passionate about what are you passionate about and i find if we change the direction a little bit what we find is that it makes the conversations a whole lot more meaningful as long as it's you know a moment where you actually do want to have the conversation <laughs> yeah all right, looks like we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. What percentage of your work is stuff you have to do but you aren't passionate about? With employees, how can I keep our work relationship separate from our friendship? How have the minimalists applied minimalism to their business, specifically your brick-and-mortar coffee shop? We'll talk a little bit about what it means to open a, a brick-and-mortar business in today's digital world and why it's it can still be necessary, but I think quite often... It's, uh, it's a goal that is completely unnecessary. And we'll talk about the difference in when, when, when does it make sense to have a brick and mortar business. Any advice on managing a high stress, toxic workplace while I'm still here? And as vague as this is, any tips on finding a more meaningful job after feeling extremely burnt out? And how do I tell my boss I am burnt out at work? Also, I wanna play another round of overrated or underrated. Uh, we're going to talk about Apple products. We're going to talk about Microsoft Excel. This will be like the business version of overrated <laughs> and underrated. Ryan and I, we just we, we throw out these different topics. Water coolers, are they overrated or underrated? We'll get to all that in a moment. And if you want to hear all that, you can listen to this week's Maximal episode available exclusively on Patreon. That's right. We're, you're currently listening to our weekly Minimal episode. But each week, Ryan and I, well, this week, Paul and I, record an entirely different long-form Maximal episode on the Minimalist's private podcast, which gives us the private space we need to talk about the topics we don't usually discuss in public. Plus, Patreon is the best way for us to fund this podcast to keep it 100% advertisement free. When you subscribe to the Minimalist private podcast on Patreon, you'll receive a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You also get access to our entire back catalog of more than 100 private podcast episodes. Find all the details and all the good stuff, including an additional podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. And before we get into that, here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. My name is Luke Pearson, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I have a comment about fitness. I'm reading a book. It's called Starting Strength. It's a very simple way to exercise. For people who go to the gym, um, it's often confusing People who like to go to the gym, it's often hard to minimize your fitness routine. So I started to read this book, and it's simple. It may not be, it may not be easy, but it is very simple. Um, and it, it's implemented in a lot of things in my life. My back is more strong. Um, just everything about me is stronger. Don't really care about what I look like, but I feel stronger and I feel healthy. Um, you know, and I just enjoy working out. But it, it was so difficult before. But now reading this book, Starting Strength by Mark Ripito. Um, just hope that helps. Definitely, if you go to the gym a lot, it will simplify your life. Hey, Josh and Ryan. This is Stephanie from San Antonio. Joshua, I believe, had recommended a book by my new favorite author, Andy Andrews. And it was called The Traveler's Gift. And that book is so, it's like the Bible, uh, another Bible without the religion. It's things, it, it tells you exactly what to do with your life, exactly what you're not doing, and basically tells you that it's all on you. And that's a really good book that I recommend to my friends. And I started reading numerous books of Andy Andrews. The Noticer is another one that's really good. I think a lot of people need to read it. It's about perception, about seeing things beyond your own point of view. That one was really good. I also, I don't know if you guys recommended this or if I just happened to stumble upon it, but there's a book called Miracle Morning by Hal 
uh, I can't think of his last name, but his first name is Hal, and it is a step-by-step, you know, get-out-of-your-funk process that you start your mornings at 5, 5 a.m., you do journaling, you do reading, you do exercising, you run your errands, and it's just a, it's a way to change, uh, another way to change your life. And they actually have a community on Facebook um, called the Miracle Morning Community, and there's people from all over the world. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Paul Jarvis for being here today. I'm really grateful you decided to spend this time with us. Check out his book. It is called Company of One. You can also check out his website. It's pauljarvis.com. You can sign up for his newsletter over there. And uh, any podcast they should check out. What are you doing this th- these days in terms of podcasts? I've got a podcast called Company of One, which is like the book. Uh-huh. And uh, I co-host a podcast called The Creative Class with uh, my business partner, Kaylee Moore, for okay. that. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, check those out. We'll put links to those in the show notes as well. And real quick for right here, right now, speaking of, of coffee, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Until recently, the only place you could get coffee from the minimalist, uh, from our coffee shop, is called Bandit Coffee Co. It's down in St. Petersburg, Florida. It was within the four walls of the brick and mortar business. But uh, recently, we launched uh, online sales for our coffee. So if folks want to get the Minimalist Choice coffee, we, we pick a new coffee every month. You just go to theminimalists.coffee is the website, and you can order coffee from there, and it updates every month. You can check out what we are currently enjoying drinking. So theminimalists.coffee to order Bandit Coffee Co.'s coffee and if you have a question comment or minimalism tip for our podcast leave us a voicemail 406-219-7839 or send a voice memo to podcast at the minimalists.com you can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash the minimalist if you want our show notes in your inbox sign up for our email list over at the minimalists.com you'll also receive our simple sunday emails each week and for our added value this week let's listen to my favorite song from an artist called Benjamin Francis Leftwich. His new album is called Gratitude, and this song sounds like the soundtrack to the most pleasant day you've had all year. Let's hear Tell Me You Started to Pray from Benjamin Francis Leftwich. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things, because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. The Minimalists.